All right, what's going on today, guys? Welcome to the Jason Wojo Podcast. I'm here with Rich Killian. He is a email deliverability, email marketing expert. He's been in this industry for over 20 years now, started in 1997. And we're going to go over a lot of email delivery, uh, email deliverability topics, you know, marketing, and also just, you know, hitting the primary tab, good subject line practices, you know, what you should be doing with your list if you don't currently send to your email list right now and what kind of practices to be looking out for. So thanks for joining the show today, man. How you doing? It's my pleasure. And uh, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So um, first question, just to kind of get a feel for like more of who you are, uh, obviously yeah. we spoke before this, but currently you know, like, do you run an email marketing agency or are you just like a solopreneur, freelancer? Uh, I run an agency. Okay. Uh, we, do, you probably, we, yeah, do you probably work with coaches, consultants, e-com stores? We we work more on the higher end, high end sending. Uh, so we, I've got some ESP customers, uh, actual uh, email service providers. Uh, we work with really big senders. Uh, for some reason, we, we're really popular in the financial newsletter space. So we work with a lot of big senders in that space. Um, but yeah, that, that's where we're at. Uh, we, uh, it's not that I don't work with smaller senders. It's just that we haven't had that opportunity yet. Uh, yeah. we've, we've really been on the, on the higher end market. No, dude, I love it. And right now, are you sending daily emails for these newsletters? Like what exactly is the scope of work for these kind of newsletters and these, and these bigger we, fish clients? We, we really guide uh, the customer, we help them with what they should be sending, how often they should be sending, um, list hygiene practices, all that kind of stuff. Then we we manage more from the back end, from the deliverability spine, uh, side of things. We make sure that there's no issues with um, block listing or issues with, and and it's not just public block lists like like spam house. It's also internal block lists because a lot of people don't realize this, but. Um, your big mailbox providers like uh, Hotmail and Yahoo and uh, Gmail, mm-hmm. all these guys, they've got internal blocking, right? Where they, uh, and that doesn't, that, there's no way to query that directly. So you've got to look at at, deliver, at the actual delivery logs. Um, so, you know, many of our customers have, they either use something like a SendGrid or a Mailgun. Um, and then we even have a lot of customers that have the on-premise stuff like Power MTA, Green Arrow, and those kind of guys. Um, so we monitor those logs and we look for issues. Um, and then we address those issues directly. Yeah, see, I see a massive problem with like mail guns. We have a lot of clients who use that and then they hook it up to go high level. And it's like, t- to me, it- it's the worst sender that I've ever seen. I, I personally hate mail gun. Um, but like right now with these financial newsletters, what do you think is the best ESP right now? Not just for that, that kind of niche, but what is the best ESP right now for deliverability, segmentation, and obviously hitting the primary as much as possible? Like what gives you the most leeway and support? I, I think there's a, a it, it needs to be clarified that any ESP that follows the rules um, is a good ESP, right? It's, it's really up to the actual sender and how the sender actually uses the ESP at the end of the day. Their practices, right? So list acquisition, list hygiene, uh, sending cadence, all that kind of stuff comes into play, right? So any ESP can be a good ESP if used correctly, right? Um, so for me, it's really a question of look at what are your requirements? What do you need to be able to do to deliver your letter, your, your newsletter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what is the functionality that you're looking for? And then go find the ESP that has that functionality and then work from there. Um, a lot of our customers use something like Vero uh, because it is okay. very, very strong on uh, the their segmentation and their automations and all that kind of stuff. But then they plug it into SendGrid. All right, so they'll have SendGrid on the back end uh, that does the actual delivery, and then they use Vero as the front end. But at the same time, Vero does have their own delivery uh, infrastructure, but they have the option where you can plug in your own SendGrid account. Um, it makes it easier from a management perspective, and especially on the, on the higher end sending, um, that's really where you want to be at. You want to have as much control as possible. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if, if you're going to do stupid stuff, you're going to get kicked off your ESP. It's as simple as that, right? If you're going so to like, be buying yeah. the list and scraping list and that kind of stuff, yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing cold email, I would recommend LemList because that's the best way to burn through domains. That's just from what I've seen because a lot of people in the agency space, they'll go through LemList, they'll buy a bunch of emails through D7 Lead Finder, run the emails, and they just buy new domains over and over and over again. They just keep burning. Uh, I don't work in that space at all, right? My my view on cold outreach is as follows, right? So 
you all know what spam is. There's a different terminology that describes spam, and that's UCE. And UCE stands for unsolicited commercial email, right? And if you look at what cold outreach is, is it unsolicited? Yes. Uh, is it a commercial? Yes. Yeah. Is it email? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thus, it's spam, right? Yeah. So we don't we don't work with anybody that does cold outreach, right? Um, I've worked with companies where they have a, a normal opt-in email program and they have cold outreach, which is separate teams. And the only reason I'll work with a company like that is if we keep the cold outreach completely out of it. We don't touch that at all. Right. So w w that, what's that, the best way to separate that though, like deliverability wise? Would they have to have two separate domains on two separate IPs? Like what's the best way to bypass that? Uh, there's no way to bypass it. It's as simple as that. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I get over 50 cold outreach emails every single day. Uh, maybe one, two, make it to the inbox. The rest go to the spam folder. The mailbox providers, the, the uh, you know Google, uh, Yahoo, all these guys, it is their business to stop that kind of, of email, right? I know cold outreach right now is it's the new buzzword in, in growth hacking, uh, and everybody wants to do it. Uh, my advice is always just don't do it. It's as simple as that, right? Yeah. If, if you want to reach out to them, find different ways that is not perceived as spam because it, it, it doesn't matter if the, the end person thinks it's spam or not, right? It, th it, it all comes down to what does the mailbox provider uh, think? And you've got to look at it from their perspective, right? They've got one job and one job only, and that is to create a wonderful experience for their customers. And their customers are the people that you are emailing, right? It is in their own interest to keep these customers on their site as long as possible. And they do that by preventing spam to go of going to, to the inbox. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's, there's lots of discussions about, oh, no, but can spam allows it? Yes, can spam allows it. But at the end of the day, with mailbox providers, their servers, their rules. That's yeah. it. It's as simple as that, right? So there, there's, there's no sugarcoating the fact that uh, cold outreach is spam, right? So, okay. And you don't have to go crazy in depth because it's really like, you know, high level stuff. But what is like the most important things right now for a business owner who's like starting to get into email? They have a list of people that they exported from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they had. So you can ask a question. I just want to take. A oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So they had, you know, they have an email list. They export it from their, you know, let's say Shopify or their ClickFunnels, right? And it's a big list of like, well, big list to some people is like five to ten thousand emails. And they're about to start sending. So what is the best way to get that email to hit the inbox? Like what, what's your first email that you're sending to make sure that deliverability sticks and that they're not going to get their domain reputation ruined? I, I started at the list acquisition point, right? How did you acquire that email address? Let, let's forget, forget the whole list. Let's look at one single email address, right? How did that person give you permission to add that address to an email list, right? And, and here's where a, a lot of companies also get it wrong, right? So, so let's, you, you mentioned Shopify. So let's say I go on Shopify and I order some keto stuff, right? Keep keto uh, supplements. Physical product gets shipped to me. What most companies do, and, and when I say most, I mean e even big companies like Apple, uh, they all do this, right? You buy something from them, you automatically get added to their list. Right, and they start sending you marketing messages. Yeah. If if you look at best practices when it comes to email marketing, that is actually not permission. Right. If I buy something from you, I give you permission to send me a receipt and to send me information specific to that product that I bought from you and nothing else. Right. So there's this assumption that, and let, let's use Apple as a big example. Right. So. I could buy a new but, iPhone. But there. isn't that why they have their own ESP though? Because it's iCloud. Isn't that why they just want to hook them all into that one system? So that like, because here's just a quick question before you keep going forward is because they have their own iCloud ESP, doesn't that mean that they control and they could literally get a hundred percent send rates because they control their own ESP? Like they never hit spam if it goes to an iCloud email. That also depends. That, that, 
I, I, iCloud is, is uh, so let, let's first get terminology correct, yeah, right? So iCloud is a mailbox provider, right? So it's MVP. Okay. And ESP is an email service provider. That's somebody like a, a MailChimp or a Aweber or a GetResponse, right? So that's the ESP part. That, that's the part that sends the bulk messages. And then the iCloud, the Gmail, the Yahoo Mail, the Hotmail, the Outlook.com, those are the mailbox providers, right? So yes, from a mailbox provider perspective, and, and again, I, I don't know what Apple's internal policies around that is, right? I don't know how their iCloud or their mailbox team works when it comes to messages that's coming from apple.com. And I, it kind of, we're getting away from where I was heading with the permission, right? So yes, it's possible that iCloud, the iCloud team can just say, ah, everybody that, that uh, anything that comes from Apple always go to, goes to the inbox. But that's the thing, right? Not everybody has an iCloud account. And, uh, you know, people sign up with different accounts. I mean, again, getting back to my example of, of Apple and buying something, right? So I go buy my new iPhone from Apple. Uh, I give them my email address to send me a receipt. Um, I give them my email address when I actually sign up in, into iCloud on the phone. Um, and now suddenly I get marketing messages from Apple. Oh, did you see the new iMac? Did you see the new Mac Mini M2 that we just released? Well, it just carries on, right? It doesn't, yes, there's some messages specific to my iPhone, right? And, and here is where, where it's difficult because the, the big corporations are doing this, right? They're saying, you buy one thing from me, I now have permission to market whatever I want to, from, to you. And, you know, in, in countries like the U.S., that is still okay for right now, but things are changing and they are changing fast, right? If you look at GDPR and um, even, even in the U.S., if you look at California, right, they, they've, they've kind of moved the little things around, but there are big changes that's coming in the industry and that's the, specifically in, in, uh, in policies around that kind of stuff. And it's, it's going to get harder and harder to say that, okay, you bought this one product for me. Now I can market my 5,000 different products that I have. I can market all of that to you, right? That's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher as things go forward, right? It's going to, it's going to more, it's going to come down to eventually we're not there yet. And this is what I, right now I would start, I would like to see people starting to implement this, right? You buy something from me online, whether it's a physical product or information product or coaching, whatever. Um, there's an option that say, and, and it must be unticked, right? There's a checkbox that says, add me to your general email marketing list. Where, and, and the wording around this is, is completely up to you, but it's got to be something around the line of, you know, this, if, you, if I add you to this list, it's not going to be product specific messages that you're going to get. It's going to be company wide messages that you're going to be getting. And that's really where the industry is heading towards, just purely because of the amount of spam that gets sent, right? Yeah. And uh, to, to give you an idea, right, so there, there's, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's something like 7 billion email messages gets delivered every single day. In a 24-hour period, 7 billion messages are delivered, right? Take a guess what percentage of that is true, true spam. 20, 30%? Probably higher. 51%. 51 51 percent of that of those messages are true spam messages um so the mailbox providers as well as their customers are getting stricter and stricter as to what they would allow and what they would look at um the consumers are getting a lot more intelligent around these things right they want very targeted messages right People don't mind being marketed to, right? That, that's how the world operates, right? So people don't mind the marketing. They want targeted marketing, all right? Imagine, for instance, you go on ClickFunnels and you buy a product that's related to weight loss. Great. You get on the list, they market to you. Phenomenal. A couple of months down the line, this person changes track completely and decides, okay, I don't want to be in the weight loss niche anymore. Uh, I'm going to start doing, uh, I don't know. Uh, Fitness coaching? No, no, that, that's, still, that's still somewhat related. I want something completely unrelated. Um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> I'm racking my brain. You're not coming up. But like a, uh, what, 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 like a brain supplement or something. 
like a focus it's, supplement? It, it, it's still supplements, right? Let, let's say this person okay. goes radically out there, right? He uh, uh, starts he starts talking about engine modifications. Or like a biz op offer. Or a biz op offer. Yeah. And he starts mailing that out, right? And and here's the thing. People do that, right? There's oh, yeah, they do. do. I know this, people who do that. Right? <laughs> exactly. And and that, that's the thing. I mean, Im imagine the always think of it from the person receiving the message always think of it from their perspective right now you signed up for the, this weight loss and i'm sending you messages about weight loss and you're happy receiving these messages and you're buying stuff from me and now i go completely in the other direction and i start modifying car engines right how on earth is that related right now there's ways to do that right there's ways where you can say look i I, I know you, this is why you're on my list. This is what you're interested in, but I'm kind of going in, a, in, a, in another direction. This or one or two more messages are going to be the last messages you're going to get from me on this topic. If you want to continue receiving messages from me on this completely separate other topic, here is a site where you can go and sign up for that. And this is what we're going to be doing there. Um, and th this is where so many people get it wrong, right? They, they believe that because somebody signed up to your list for a specific thing, you can now market whatever you want to them. I mean, I'm sure you've en ended up on a solo ad seller's list. Yeah. Man, the garbage <laughs> that goes out there. And then and you get some of these guys that, that and well, guys and girls. Because I mean, it's, a, it's a quick cash grab. Yeah, yeah, oh, and, and they'll. I mean, I've I've seen people uh, offers uh, or send seven different offers in a single day. Seven. I mean, it's, it's total insanity, right? But then what they do is they get the quick cash grab and then they sell their email list, or they do an affiliate, oh, yeah. or they do oh, some yeah. other bullshit that's obviously like not compliant or not even congruent, just to make a quick buck. So it's like just ruin the fucking ecosystem so much more. It's terrible. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, the, the thing is, everybody needs to start thinking of their subscribers as a single human being and think of whatever they're sending from the perspective of that human being. Forget the money, right? It, it is about the relationship. And it, it, here's, a, uh, here's a fun story, right? So a couple of years ago, I was in uh, San Diego. I was speaking at an, at an event specifically about uh, email marketing and email deliverability. And I start off my presentation with... It's not the size of the list that matters. It's how you use it. And I look out over the audience and you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and as I look down, there is a priest so, <laughs> with, with his collar on the works sitting right in front. I'm like, I'm sorry, Father. I'm sorry. But I hope I get my point across, right? Mm -hmm. it, is, it doesn't matter how big your list is. It's about the relationship that you have with your list, right? That is what it's all about. That's where the true money is, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen people with 1,000 subscribers make 10 times what people with 100,000 subscribers make, yeah. right? It's because there's that relationship, right? And if, if you look at, at the best marketers out there, they tell a story. They always tell a story. It's the story that sells, right? And yeah. and one of the masters of this is Russell Brunson, right? Russell Brunson is phenomenal when it comes to telling stories. Um, there's an another guy. I, I'm, I doubt you will have heard of him. Uh, he's a he's an affiliate marketer based out of the UK. A guy called Martin Avis. Um, it, trust me, go go find Martin Avis and get on his list. The it, his emails are ridiculously long right it is it is pages and pages long right but he he tells you about his life right right so he's yeah. he's re he was i can't remember what industry was in before he retired and then got into affiliate marketing so he'll tell you about you know he went to see watch this movie with his wife and they'll give you the his thoughts on the movie that he's, he watched and you know after the movie they went to this restaurant and they had this food and they paired it with this wine and this is how it was and this was how the quality of service was but here's the thing that he does absolutely phenomenally well right so he takes that whole story and he blends it into what he's selling yeah right and he is absolutely phenomenal at that better than anybody i've ever seen out there um yeah uh, i'm trying to kickstart newsletter i think is he's something like that martin but yeah avis, you said what was his name martin avis yes okay cool i'm gonna write that down
Yeah, because I'm always looking at like how people wrap the storytelling, keep the curiosity, and then branch it into what they're selling by using an analogy from the experience or the story to where the story is then selling itself. You're not really selling the product anymore. You're just selling the stories. And ever since we were kids, we always enjoyed stories or bedtime stories or the case may be. But people as adults, we lose touch of that because we're like, oh, well, they don't want to hear a story. They just want to know what I'm offering. And I'm like, ah, we still like stories because people still read and people still like watching long YouTube videos of podcasts and people still like doing those things. Those are all stories, even though like, yeah, maybe podcasts aren't stories, but you still wrap stories into Q and a it's yeah, like, yeah. it's still the same dialogue. And I, I promise you, Martin Avis is, he's absolutely a master at taking his own personal life, the stuff that he's doing, telling you about that, and turning that into a story that then ties into whatever product he's busy selling or busy promoting at the time. Um, yeah, he's, he's really good. Definitely get on his list and, and just just look at what he does. Phenomenal. I'm sure you're, you're on Russell's uh, list. Same yeah, thing. Russell's he, so he, good. He, he doesn't tie in personal life as much as but Martin. When he does, I mean, though, it crushes. Like when, when, he sold, when he sold ClickFunnels 2.0 at the event, he mm -hmm. wrapped in the kids and stuff, and he made like so much money on stage. I think it was like over a million and a half dollars on, on, on stage. It was nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was very, very impressive to see. Because when you don't show something for so long, it's kind of like Gary V. Gary V doesn't show you his wife or his kids. Mm -hmm. And then if he finally does like release it or whatever, it's going to give him a spike or whatever the case may be. Because the curiosity has just been hold for so long. Like it's just, it's all about just the whole reveal piece. Um, and there's yeah. a lot of people who like, but Grant Cardone, guys like that, they show everything. Like yeah. they know about the wife, the kids, the houses, like there's like a little, does he realize that all the stuff that he shows, like, you know, where he lives, like you could find Pretty his, much. that's terrible. I will, I would never yeah. want to do that. Like drone Indeed. shots over the house. You can see the other house next to it. You can see the road. You can see like all of the shit. And it's like, dude, people know where you live now. Like that's yeah. not that I want privacy. Like, fuck, that's terrible. Yeah. I mean, there's, I, I always believe you, you, you've you got a private life and you've got a public life. And uh, those two should never blend, especially not the yeah. way that Grant does it. I mean, he, he really goes overboard. Yeah. And, uh, there, there's a few people that do yeah, that. Yeah, and I was watching a podcast uh, on Ben Shapiro yesterday because he's very, like, a polarizing dude. I don't know if you know who Ben Shapiro is. He's, like, very political. Yeah. And he spends almost $3 million a year in security. I'm like, dude, that's wow. ridiculous. Like, they have six security guards watch their house at night five during the day, four when he travels, like all that. And I'm like, dude, what the hell? And then when they go out to eat, they got to bring two with them. And I'm like, dude, that's crazy. Like, how do you even, like, you got to look over your shoulder. Even if you have security too, that's the funny part is that we always say that like planes are safe, right? And we get on a plane and even if it starts shaking a little bit, we know that the chance of a plane crashing is so little, but we still look out the window. We still will open up the window and check. Like, are we good? It's yeah, the same yeah. thing with that. It's like, even if you have two security guards, you're still going to look over your shoulder once in a while, even if you think that they have your back. Mm. It's like, I just, I can never live like that. That's just weird. Plus yeah. everybody's staring at you. Yeah. No. You can't even eat in peace. It's crazy. But yeah, no, definitely don't want that. Yeah, but man. anyway, let, let, heading back into the email deliverability. All right. I, for me, the biggest thing is always number one permission. Number two relationship with your list. All right. And when it, when it comes to, to hitting the inbox um, over and above the permission and the relationship. Uh, there's, there's so many, let me backtrack one second here. Uh, I was at a conference a few years back and one of the people that works, uh, he's one of the senior people in Gmail. And at the time, and again, I think this was 2016, run about there somewhere. He said at that time, and it's probably more than this now, at that time, for every single message that gets delivered into Gmail, right? They look at over 200 different data points. Wow. Over 200 to make a decision on, uh, are they gonna accept the message to begin with or bounce it? If they do accept it, where does it go, right? Over 200 data points, 2016. Now you can imagine what it is right now, right? It's a lot more than that right now. Um, so yeah, it's permission, relationship right those those are the two key things um yeah that, that, those are the, the that's the biggest that's the biggest thing you can tell anybody when it comes to email marketing get permission build a relationship right sell 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 just that doesn't work anymore i mean for some people it works to a point um 
Grant is one of those people, right? He's like, all I do is sell. If you don't like it, get on my list. Yeah. That's it. Done. I don't care. Right. He's got a massive, massive list, and I'm sure he makes a lot of money from that. Oh, yeah. Um <laughs> it, it's it's not the type of person that I am, it's not the type of person I want to be. Um it's not that I don't sell. Of course I sell. Uh, everybody sells, right? Even if you're not a salesperson, you sell. Yeah. Every single body sells, right? Yeah. Um, you sell to, to get a job, right? You sell to get a, a life partner. You sell for anything that you do. You sell. That, that's just, it's life. Yeah. Um, but being pushy, uh, especially with an email list, it, it yeah, cannot and will not work long term yeah. ever. Yeah, then your Oprah rates will just fall and then you're just still. Well, that's the thing too is like not just spam, but promo. The less open rates you get, I feel like also the verbiage that you're using, like when you use a lot of money terms and time frames and like a lot of emojis and money signs and emails, they do go to promo a lot more than spam. Spam, I, I, spam, I see a lot more emails that have a shit ton of images in it and GIFs go to spam than anything mm-hmm. else. So the, the, there's a couple of things, right? That, that I want to touch on, on on what you've said right now, right? So if we look at the tabs, right? It's not just the promo tab. There's, there's a bunch of tabs and it's not just Gmail that does it. Uh, Hotmail does it or Outlook does it anyway. I think Yahoo does some of it. Um, but here's the thing, right? And and this would, the, the, there's, this, there's this impression in the industry that if you hit the promo tab, it's like all oh, hell is going to break loose, right? It's the end of the world. Um, there's something wrong. But you guess what? The promo tab is still the inbox. Yeah. It is still the inbox. That's very important, right? You made it to the inbox, right? You, you, you may be in a different tab than the primary one. And th- there's a few things around this, right? So um, I, th- I can't remember when I saw the study. It was, it was a year or so ago. Um, only 35% of all Gmail users have tabs turned on. 35%. That, that's not a large number, right? We, we don't even hit it. We're not even hitting the halfway mark of all users on Gmail, right? 35% are the, is, that's the only percentage that has the tabs turned on, right? That's number one. Number two, people expect marketing messages to be in the promotions tab, right? Unless they, right, let, let you use Martin Avis as an example, right? They want to see his messages. They never, ever want to miss it, right? So they drag it into the primary and they may have to do it a few times because it takes a while for, for the algorithms to learn what you want. And we're going to get back to what you want in a second. <laughs> um, but so people that, that are suddenly receiving marketing messages in the primary tab that they expect to see in the promo tab are much more likely to mark a message as spam because it's sitting in the primary tab and not the promo tab. Much, much more likely. And, and this is, again, there, there's been studies done around this, and it, it is a fact that people will do that. So on the U part, this is also what a lot of people don't realize, right? That all of your tier one mailbox providers, right? Your, uh, your Gmail, your Yahoo, Hotmail, et cetera, et cetera. They all do individual level filtering. So I can receive a message in my promo tab. You can receive that same message in your primary tab. And somebody else can get that exact same message, same send, the same everything in the spam folder. Because the Google algorithms learn what you specifically do, what you are interested in, what you are interacting with. And based on that, they make decisions, right? So it is on an individual level, right? It's very seldom for Google to go or for any of the tier one providers to go like, okay, you, Mr. Sender, we just blocking you outright. You, it's, everything's going to spam. It happens, but not as often as people think, right? You've got to be really egregious in the stuff that you're doing <laughs> to get a blanket spam or a blanket block completely. Um, so th- there's this individual level filtering that happens. And this is also why you, you, you get a lot of these, um, these monitoring applications like Glock apps, and there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Now, they have their uses, right? They, they're good as an, as an indicator. But you've got to understand that just because 
that tool tells you your message is in the primary or your message is in uh, promo or in spam or missing doesn't mean that the next person in line that's going to happen to them right it may be in a completely different place mm -hmm. for an actual real person that's getting it because all all these providers are doing is right they they create a whole bunch of addresses uh, on all the the major mailbox providers and some of the smaller ones as well um, and they monitor it through APIs and all kinds of stuff. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? As I said, there is a place for those tools and I use them myself, um, but people have got to see that as an indicator. Um, and speaking of indicators, right? You mentioned open rates. Sorry, let me just take one sip of water. Yeah, I get it. I'm getting a little excited. Yes, I, I talk a lot. <laughs> I actually had iced coffee this morning. Um, so open rates, right? Um, Here's something that, that so many people don't actually realize. Open rates has been wildly, wildly inaccurate for a very long time. Very long time. So people made such a big um, ruckus about Apple mail privacy protection, right? Where it's going to mess up your open rates. Now, all Apple MPP is doing, right? It is preloading images. So it is providing a better experience to their end user, right? So when I open Apple Mail on here, whatever uh, email account I'm looking at, right? Based on certain criteria that Apple doesn't share publicly, but people have been able to figure out a few things, but it, it basically boils down to Apple will preload the images for the messages that's coming into my Apple Mail on my iPhone and Apple Mail on my Mac. Um, so that I get a better experience because when I open that message, the image displays instantly instead of having to download from whatever remote source that it's on. And the way that open tracking works from an ESP perspective is it's, it's just an invisible one pixel by one pixel image, right? And that image gets tagged with a whole long string and that's how the ESP's track opens. But Apple is not the first company that's done this, right? Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, they've been doing this for years, years, yeah. right? I mean, I, I can show you right now where I'll send a message to a Gmail account and I hit send and a few seconds later, there's an open. I could check that open, it's a Gmail account, right? Or a Google Apps account, yeah. right? So because of this image preloading, open rights has been ridiculously off for a long, long, long time. Here's the, here's the other problem, right? So now because it's so much more prevalent with Apple MPP, open rates are skyrocketing, yeah. right? I've seen customers have an average open rate of 30%, go up to 70%. I've seen this happen. And this is all because of Apple MPP. So you cannot rely on open rates as a success metric when it comes to email marketing, right? You've got to look, you've got to track it all the way through, right? And I mean, as long as you're tagging all of your links with UTM parameters, right, using Google Analytics, you mm -hmm. can track it all the way down, all the way through to a sale, right? So you can say, this message brought in X amount. Right? Yeah, I honestly just focus on LTV. That's like the only KPI that I use. Yeah. It's how yeah. long that, that lead is nurtured and how much they spend over 12 months. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's then I can, the way yeah, to hook and, and then I can see what emails were the best. And then I can just compile them at the end of the year and be like, okay, like if these angles work, then we're going to use these next year and just maybe retweak them or, you know, just reverse engineer them. That's just kind of how I look at it. Uh, open rate does still have use, right? To, uh, uh, just because you have all of this, this preloading stuff doesn't mean you must take that away, right? You want to leave that there because if you're sitting at a, a especially now with M M Apple MVP, if you're sitting at a 60% open rate and suddenly you drop to 5%, now you know you're either going to the spam folder or you're being blocked outright, right? So it is an indicator of, uh, look at it as a canary in the coal mine, right? It's an indicator. That there's a major problem that you need to attract, right? So you still want to watch the trend of your open rate over time. But if you're seeing a 60% open rate, don't get excited at all. Same is true for clicks, right? Clicks is not as bad as, as opens, but especially when you're doing uh, B2B, um, a lot of the B2B companies are using stuff like Proofpoint and there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, and many of those appliances uh, can be set up to actually follow links, right? Because they want to go check, is there 
uh, something bad at the end of this link, right? So they'll follow the link all the way to the end. Doesn't matter how many hops there are in between, they'll follow it. Um, that's also dangerous if you have a one-click unsubscribe, mm -hmm. right? There, there's some companies that, or some ESPs that offer the option to subscribers where they click once and it's immediately, they immediately unsubscribe, right? There isn't a one more page that says, are you sure? Right. So the one click unsubscribe, yeah. when it comes to B2B, you're losing a lot of subscribers, right? If the, uh, the B2B email provider is using one of these appliances, right? And many of them do, right? It, they, they, uh, it's, it's big business for these uh, anti-spam, anti-malware, et cetera, et cetera, appliances and software companies. Um, yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Yeah, and the other thing too is like um, even with like when you talk about the open rates and how they've skyrocketed, I've seen a big hike because we mostly work with like e-com stores. Mm. So we use Clavio. And the biggest thing that I okay. see is like when we – this might be just farce, but when I'm sending a lot of emails that have an image at the bottom, okay? So like we don't put images on the top of an email. We put the image of the product on the bottom and we make the actual picture clickable for some weird odd reason, even though people will say all the time, like, oh, if you put more images in there, like that can, you know, hike your spam or promo rates. For some reason, it's actually hiking up my open rates by having a picture on the bottom instead of putting it at the top of the email. So I don't know what your opinion is on that because sometimes maybe the AI just scans it from top to bottom and figures if it's not too early in the email, then it allows it. Also, the thing too that's worked is when we have an image and we actually screenshot it and crop it. So when you have a regular JPEG image, it's going to be 10 megabytes or more. But when we screenshot it, it's less than 500 megabytes. And when we use an image and just compress it, it's just it doesn't affect the open rates as much. I, I don't know what you think about that, but I, I just that's just what I've seen is using the screenshot and putting the image at the bottom of the email and making it clickable hikes up our CTRs and the open rates don't get affected. Um, it's I, I think it's it's very much down to the customers that you're mailing to um, from from a, a pure deliverability perspective. Um, unless you're doing the old style spam where the whole message is one big image. Oh, um, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> and, and So unless you're doing that, uh, you're not going to see much problems from, from okay. images. And I mean, it's, there is a, it's down to user experience, right? It's down to what your users are looking for, what your users are looking at. Um, so, yeah, I, it's, I mean, the, the, the only stuff when it, when it, with that kind of stuff is link shorteners, right? Uh, uh, m so many of these link shorteners, the bitlies and, and all those kind of, they, they all block listed everywhere, right? Because they've been abused so heavily. And because of that widespread block listing, you definitely can have issues if you're using any of these public um, yeah. link shortness and that kind of stuff. But when it comes to images and image placement, again, that, that is very much down to the audience that's being spoken to, right? Uh, from from a, uh, an email delivery algorithm perspective, I'm not aware of that causing any issues, right? Good or bad. Um, it's, it's really down to, to the audience that you're talking to at that point. So, and to that point, right, so there, there's, um, uh, there's also this, this big misconception in, in the wider marketing industry of spam trigger words, right? Don't use free, don't use this, don't use that, et cetera, et cetera. For the most part, the, again, on, on a tier one mailbox provider level, that doesn't matter anymore. Right, you can you can use any spam trigger word that you could possibly think of, um, and as long as there is a good relationship with your list and they want to receive your messages, you're gonna to go to to the inbox. Plain and simple. Um, I I was in a webinar a couple of months back with, uh, and I I was just uh, um, in the audience. I was just watching, and one of the presenters was uh, one of the product uh, managers at Yahoo Mail. And somebody asked this question about spam trigger words. And he said, look, from a mailbox provider perspective, we have customers that do want to receive messages about Viagra and Cialis and pornography and dating and all that kind of stuff. Who are we to say that they, they shouldn't be getting those messages? If they want those messages, 
our algorithms will learn that they want those messages and allow it, right? Our customers from Yahoo perspective want to receive free offers, right? So we don't look at words in the message anymore. Yeah. Words matter when it comes to your audience and how your audience perceives a message, right? If you are, uh, let's use Martin Avis again as an example, right? So Martin Avis never, ever swears in his emails, ever, right? You will never hear a cuss word or see a cuss word in, in his emails at all. That's just not the type of person that he is, right? But if he now suddenly starts swearing and every second word is, is an F-bomb, he's going to lose a large part of his audience because that's not who they are. That's not who they expect him to be, Right. But if you, and, and I can't think of an example here, but if you get on a marketer's list and they tell you right up front, look, I swear a lot. If you don't like it, don't get on my list, right? And every second or third word is an F-bomb from day one, from the first email, right? Yeah. As long as the people are aware yeah. of that and they accept that, it's not an issue. And it's not going to be an issue from an algorithm perspective either. Because again, people swear, right? It is the world that we live in, yeah. right? So, yeah, it's... It's that audience thing. It's that relationship with the audience. And now, to be fair, the smaller mailbox providers, and, and not even the cable, the lower down than cable, right? Your local little ISP, right? They use what most every, most all of the mailbox providers, where they all came from when it comes to spam filtering. And that's, that's a free software called Spam Assassin. And Spam Assassin has rules, right? And yes, those look at spam trigger words, right? So if you have a lot of local ISP people on your list, then yes, you have to worry about spam trigger words. Okay. But from my experience, and, and I've worked with customers that has many millions on their list, 65% um, or more is Gmail. And Gmail? It's the most popular is, one. There's no such thing as spam trigger words at Gmail. No. Wow. I was, I was again, on a different webinar, and, and I attend a lot of webinars uh, because it's the industry that I, I'm in, and, and I've got this firm belief that I'm always learning. Um, and even if I learn one single new thing from a webinar, it was worth sitting on it for 45 minutes to two hours yeah. sometimes. Um, and this guy had a fun story. Also, He was also a deliverability consultant. And he said that, um, you know, he was also talking about specifically about spam trigger words. And he said the only single time that he's seen a, a word cause a message go to spam at Gmail was just after the January 6th incident um, in the US at the Capitol. Yeah. Um, and one of his clients sent out a message and there was 37 occurrences of the word who in the message 37 Jeez. was a long message but yeah. still 37 occurrences of the word coup i think it was a day or two days after january 6 all he did was change those words send the exact same message and it got delivered to the inbox wow but again that's a very extreme example yeah. had that message had who one, two, or three times in it? Yeah, yeah, if I would have hit, yeah, yeah, interesting. So yeah, spam trigger words definitely not a thing when it comes to tier one mailbox providers. I'm not so sure on the cable level, um, but tier one, not at all. There's there's too many other things that they look at. And again, you know, as this guy from Yahoo said. People want the Viagras and they want the Cialis and the porn and the dating and all that kind of stuff, right? If people That's sign true. up for it, they want it, yeah. right? Plain and simple. Of course. Well, I, I appreciate your input. This was definitely very enlightening for me because I can kind of implement some of this stuff because I need to, like, I do storytelling in my emails, but I just need to get more in tune with, like, not trying to do so many marketing emails and hooking it in better. And just understanding like that it's usually about the user. And I don't think about that sometimes. Um, Look, every single message can be a marketing message. That's just how it it's is. It's going to be story told and, correctly. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, again, Martin Abers, every single message that he sends is selling something. Every single message. Um, he doesn't send often. 
you know, he'll send one once a week on in general. Um, if there's a big promo on LV two or three times in a week, right? Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you can't mail every day. You can mail every day. And here's another thing, right? Set the expectation correctly right at the beginning, right? I don't know if you you've you've ever signed up to Ben Settle's list. No. Okay, so Ben Settle is uh, is an interesting guy that that does a lot of in, email marketing stuff as well, and and he tells you on his on his uh, actual landing page where you sign up, he's like, I mail every single day, sometimes more than once a day. If you don't want to see that that many messages, do not sign up to my list. Yeah. I have one, I have one client. We send six emails a day. Um, that's just insane, but he wants it because he sells Rolex watches. He's a dealer in New York City. Mm. So we send six emails a day and it makes a fuck ton of money, but it's just kind of annoying because his open rates are like 12 to 15%. And I'm just like, dude, we're killing this list. But he just churns so much money from it because the amount of organic traffic he gets, he gets over like 500 new email opt-ins a day. And it's like, he doesn't care. Yeah, I mean, if you look at a 10 to 15% open rate and you factor in Apple MPP, it's probably more down like between 2 and 4% if he's lucky the actual wheel opens. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's... I, 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 had, I had a client like that as well, financial newsletter based, um, same thing, seven, seven emails a day. Um, and every email was a different offer. And they couldn't understand why they're not hitting the inbox at Gmail. Right. And I, I spent almost a year with that client and it was the most frustrating year of my life. Right. I kept telling them, you are mailing too much. It's as simple as that. I mean, there's there's no relationship whatsoever. You're hard selling seven messages a day, seven days a week. That makes no sense to anybody. I'm like, dude, are you going to read this many messages in days? Like, hell no. It's like, why are you sending so many then? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, we, we parted ways, not in a good way because I couldn't get them to consistently land in the inbox of Gmail. <laughs> See you guys. See you. Good luck. <laughs> well, thanks Rich. Yeah, no, thank you for the input and advice. I appreciate you being on the show. Uh, That's my pleasure. They, thank you for yeah, having yeah. me. Where can they follow you right now? Uh, just inboxjam.com. Uh, you can sign up to my list on there. Uh, I uh, that that's the best place to find me. I'm I'm not very active on social. It's just it's a cesspool that I'm not interested it's, in. <laughs> dude, I understand. It's it's a lot of headaches, but yeah, man, I appreciate it. I'll have this posted in the next week, and then um, I'll send you an email with the link to so you can share it with your list, whatever the case may be. And then I will, you know, we'll we'll stay connected through email. It's a pleasure having you, man, and thanks for being on the show. Absolutely, thank you for having me. All Been right. fantastic. Thanks, Rich. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Jason. Bye.